today uh, we're going to talk about Romans 7, 1 through 6. And we're going to start with George Edward Wright. Uh, George Edward Wright is a bad, bad man. Uh, his life of crime started in 1962 when he was a teenager. Uh, he and a friend uh, took shotguns and on the day after Thanksgiving uh, robbed a gas station. They got $35 each uh, for their efforts. As part of the heat, in the heat of the moment, uh, George's partner fired a shot, hit the manager of the gas station who died two days later, leaving a 14-year-old daughter without a father. George was hungry after that, so he went out and bought a couple cheeseburgers and played shuffleboard um, while the man was bleeding at the gas station. No surprise, he was arrested a few days later, uh, convicted to 15 years in prison. 15 years was a little bit long for George. He didn't want to wait that long. So uh, he hooked up with some other felons in the prison. They hot-wired the warden's car and drove away into the night, and he went into hiding. Next time George Wright appeared was 1972. He was dressed as a priest on a Delta Airlines flight. And the reason why he dressed as a priest was so he could hide a gun uh, inside his vestments. He and a couple other people hijacked the plane, took it to Miami, uh, got a million dollars in ransom, flew to Algeria where they escaped. George Wright. Spent the rest of his life on the run. It went from Algeria to Germany, from Germany to France, from France to Guinea-Bissau, before finally settling down in Portugal, where he was hidden from the outside world. And then something unexpected happened. George Edward Wright, now host Jorge dos Santos, met Jesus, gave his life completely to him, gave his world to Christ, joined Grace Baptist Church, was baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. And you know what happened after that? George started working with his hands uh, to earn a living. He married, raised two kids. He volunteered for charities. He uh, helped to renovate a, an outreach center for HIV-positive children. He painted over graffiti in, in downtown Lisbon. He fed meals to homeless people. He, he coached basketball. He lived his life a long time. He said later, um, I've asked God to forgive me, talking about his criminal past, and I think God has forgiven me, but the law, the law says other things, and George was right. It took the FBI 41 years, but they tracked him down in Portugal, and they sent the, the Portuguese authorities to arrest George Edward Wright. And then the Portuguese government did something unexpected. They didn't turn him over to the United States for extradition. Instead, after a trial, extradition trial in Portugal, they set him free. The question was not whether they had gotten the right man. Everyone knew they had gotten the right man. The question was whether they had gotten the same man. And the, the decision of the Portuguese authorities was that they had not. One reporter explained it this way. They don't even see him as George Wright anymore. He's Jorge Santos and has been for years. George Wright no longer exists. How can you punish a man who doesn't exist? So as far as Portugal is concerned, George Wright is dead. Therefore, no longer bound by the penalties of US law. And in his place, even today, I think he's like 78 or 79 now, even today, Jorge Santos lives in Christ as a free man. What I think is interesting about that is that some of you are kind of annoyed right now. <laughs> you know this guy's a murderer and a hijacker and a criminal and a felon. And sure, he gave his life to Jesus, but he's still got to pay for his crimes. Well, um, you're the ones I want to talk to today. <laughs> and I include me in that group, so... I want you to know that in the spiritual sense, this uh, thing that happened to George Edward Wright, Jorge Santos, is, is what has happened to us. It's what Jesus does, what he has done and continues to do for each of us. Uh, he erases the power, the punitive power of the law, sets us free to follow him instead. Let's listen to the way the Apostle Paul uh, put it in Romans 7, 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers, 
for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. Our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. All right, uh, in this passage, Paul is talking about the difference between legalism and faith. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And as we talk, we're going to have to address four main questions. Number one, what was legalism then in Paul's time? Number two, what is legalism now? What does it look like now in our time? Number three, really, what's so wrong with a little bit of legalism? And number four, how am I then to live? Uh, let's work through this passage verse by verse. We'll start with verse one. Paul says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Now, when Paul says, I'm speaking to those who, knows, who know the law, he's speaking to the Jews in the Roman congregation. Remember, the Roman congregation in, in, in uh, the con Christian congregation in Rome was made up of a Jewish section and a Gentile section. The Jews were the old veterans. Jews were people like us, been in church for a long time, knew what they were doing. Uh, Gentiles were newer to the faith. And these people, uh, in this situation, Paul speaks to them, the Jews, allowing the Gentiles to listen in. Now, for the Jews in Rome at this time, the law encompassed uh, two major things. First of all, there were 613 commands in the Torah, the first five books of what is our Old Testament. Uh, that was the, the core of the law, the commands in the Torah. And then uh, they also added literally thousands of pages of, of, of uh, oral tradition supposed to help people live out uh, what God wanted. It was considered, let's see here, a uh, link between Scripture and Jewish practice. And if you've read the Bible at all, you know the Pharisees were great at that. Uh, that was their big deal, all the oral tradition law. So these are the main things that they would think of when they think about the law. But in this time, there were also three kind of watershed issues uh, that, that came up that would define how you were a law giver, or a law keeper, or, or a law breaker. And that was circumcision, uh, that was observance of the Sabbath, and that was the dietary restrictions, the kosher uh, dietary lifestyle. Now those, those were controversial because uh, the Christian faith came directly at odds with those. Remember, Jesus spoke directly against all the traditions associated with the Sabbath and even came, went to the point of doing things like healing people on the Sabbath. I mean, come on. And he said that uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Uh, the Apostle Paul earlier had cut away at circumcision in, earlier in Romans. I'll oh, see, they got that joke in the first service. <laughs> Um, and other, and elsewhere he'll do that as well. And so he was very strong about how circumcision was not an act of righteousness that, that put you in favor with God. And then the Apostle Peter had done away with the kosher laws, with the dietary restrictions, after he saw a vision of God laying down a sheet uh, with animals and things on it. So all of these things were controversial at the time, and it's important to know that because in the next verse, when Paul gives an example of what he's saying, uh, you're free from the law, he uses none of them. He instead uh, works to bring people together. And so he talks about marriage uh, between a woman and a man and the death, how death annuls the law of marriage. This was an appeal to the obvious. There was no one, no Jew, no Gentile, who would have, a, who would have uh, disagreed with that. What Paul's doing here is creating a common ground from which to jump off from. So he says, because a woman has lost her husband to death, she is therefore no longer bound to the law of death. So that gets us uh, to where we need to go for the next one. Verse 4. Uh, this verse 4 is the key sentence in this entire passage. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time here. So Paul says in Romans 7, 4, Likewise, my brother, 
you have also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So a couple things to understand. First, uh, Paul is speaking of a literal spiritual state, uh, a state in eternity where Christ has made this to happen. But, you know, we're not in eternity yet. We can't really understand what he's talking about. And so in order to communicate that in a way we understand, he's using a figurative language, a metaphor of death. Obviously, the people who received this letter were not dead, right? They were still breathing. Obviously, we are still breathing. And so what we have here is a metaphorical description of a literal truth. You have died to the law. Now, the other thing I want to point out is when when he talks about the body of Christ here, uh, this is a reference to the literal physical body of Christ. This is not talking about the church. He's talking about Christ who suffered and bled and died on the cross uh, in order to, that we might have vicarious benefit from that. So, when we look at Romans 7, 4, you, have also di- you also have died to the law. That word, the Greek root used for the word that we translate as died is thanatos. Now, if you are a fan of Marvel superhero movies, you are probably familiar with this word because it was shortened just a little bit to create the name of one of the most notorious villains in all of the Avengers history. If you know that, you're cool. (laughs) If you don't know that, I feel sorry for you. Uh, This word in Paul's time was actually the proper name for the Greek god of death, uh, the personification of death. Of death, uh, It was not like this back then, but we might think of it today like the Grim Reaper, uh, the guy with the scythe and the, and the hood. Uh, this um, was that, what that word referenced, and therefore you will not be surprised to understand that its literal meaning means to put to death. Shocker, right? What you may not know is this word also carried with the idea of uh, to be rid of or to part of. From. So when Paul's talking about you also are, have died to the law, he's saying in essence, in the way we might say it, is you are dead and gone to the law. Uh, it has no longer has anything to do. It's like if we might say Abraham Lincoln is dead and gone. Uh, it's just completely, go- we're completely rid of that because of the death. Now, Christians historically have fought really hard against this theology. We, uh, as a people, tend to love rules and uh, regulations and law and restrictions. We find prestige in it. We find power in it. We think we're actually pleasing God um, when we do things uh, that we restrict ourselves and restrict uh, the way we express our faith. And I'll give you an example. I hold in my hand uh, the rule of St. Benedict. Uh, This has been around for about 1,500 years. It was written as a guideline for monks and priests um, in fact, it's, it's, if you look at it online, you'll find people call it it's compassionate and wise and, and all these kinds of wonderful glowing terms. You studied it in seminary. I had to study it in seminary. Um, I don't agree with what most people think about uh, the rule of St. Benedict, and I'll tell you why. I think it is a prime example of legalism in our Christian history. So here's what I'm going to do. Everybody stand up with me right now. Stand up. I am going to start a new monastic order. You are all in. Congratulations. We are now part of the holy order of Sinner Mikey. And um, all I'm going to do is, all you have to do is obey the rules that are the same as what St. Benedict gave to us. Wise old St. Benedict. What I want you to do is, uh, as I read through the rules that you need to obey... If you hear something that you feel a little uncomfortable about, maybe it seems a little legalistic to you, maybe it seems like it's uh, not appropriate to your expression of faith, you can go ahead and sit down, because we don't want you anyway, right? (laughs) All right, here's the deal. First and foremost, since I wrote the rule, uh, I am your unquestioned supreme authority, and you must do everything I command. (laughs) Only what I command. All shall follow, oh, smart crowd, way to go. Good. I was worried that some of you might still be standing. (laughs) But listen to some of these things uh, that have governed the lives of Christians. In this monastery, uh, and also in in both Protestantism and Catholicism, 
Now remember, this is uh, the rule of St. Benedict that is revered in Christendom. Uh, the person in charge of the, of the monastery, I'm going to call him Abbot Hitler because I'm the one up here, right? <laughs> he is to replace the divine and fallible position of God himself in your life. He is believed, as Benedict said, he is believed to hold the place of Christ in the monastery. You are not allowed to speak without permission because uh, the master speaks and the disciple listens. You're not permitted to pray unless I tell you to pray, and you have to pray at only the times when I tell you to pray. And when I tell you to pray, you better make it brief uh, because God obviously gets tired of prayer. You have to sleep in your work clothes because I may wake you up any time and tell you to get out in the field and get to work. You're not allowed to own anything. Uh, You cannot give, receive, retain anything. You're not allowed to send or receive mail from your loved ones. You're not allowed to... um, do anything, and if you break the rule, I'm allowed to beat the heck out of you whenever I want. Did I mention this is like revered, taught in seminaries? And you think, yeah, okay, sure, that's then, this is now. Well, there are thousands of Benedictine monks and priests right now living under this rule, and not only that, uh, this rule has influenced much of Western Christianity and the way we practice it, and you'll find elements of it in Methodist churches, in Pentecostal churches, in Baptist churches, and dare I say it, even in non-denominational churches like ours. Now, it's easy uh, to look at this and say, sheesh, man, those ancient people, they were so messed up over circumcision, and the rule of St. Benedict, they're so messed up over these things, but uh, now I'm going to start talking about what, um, what legalism might be today. Here's a definition, uh, a working definition you can use for legalism. Is legalism is those religious practices we impose on ourselves and others as a means toward achieving rightness, righteousness and obtaining God's favor. I grew up in Oklahoma, and uh, in Oklahoma, we often were told the story of saintly Aunt Sadie, and she was from wherever who happened to be speaking was from, Bartlesville or Barstow, it doesn't matter, that was where they were from. Uh, now, saintly Aunt Sadie was a pillar of her little country church. She always sat in the back row, and she went to every service, and she tithed, and she did it all. And one day, her preacher got up to preach, and he started speaking about the evils of the flesh. And he said, that alcohol, that's just poison pouring into your body. You need to abhor, abhor alcohol and stay away from it. And Aunt Sadie said, amen, yes, preacher, you tell it, preacher, you go on. And then he said, and smoking cigarettes, that just puts, that just puts cancer in your lungs. You're, you're defiling the temple of God. You need to stop... Stop smoking cigarettes. And Aunt Sadie said, that's right, preacher. You tell him. You tell him, preacher. And then the preacher said, and chewing tobacco, that's just cancer in the mouth. You need to get rid of that. And she, Sadie leaned to her friend and said, well, now he's quit preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> I fear that in a few minutes you're going to think I've quit preaching and gone to meddling. So I want you to remember a few things. First of all, you love me. And I love you, and I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm just here to, to speak truth and help, help you. Um, you know, we talk about Greg, Pastor Greg being the father of our church, uh, and we talk about Pastor Gary being the grandfather of our church. I'm about eight, nine years younger than Pastor Gary and about eight, nine years older than Pastor Greg, so I figure that makes me the crazy uncle of the church. <laughs> crazy Uncle Mikey, you can call me that. I'm the guy who sometimes embarrasses you in front of your friends by the things he says, but you love me anyway, because when you were a kid, I took you to comic book stores, and I let you eat the sugary cereal at my house. So just, just remember that kind of stuff. I'm going to read to you uh, what I'm calling the Ten Commandments of Modern Legalism. Uh, and uh, I had originally intended to say something about each one of these, because I actually have a lot to say about everything on this list. But after the re- reaction that it got during teaching team this week, I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the list, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak to you individually and and see what happens. Ten Commandments of Modern Christian Legalism. Number one, thou shalt not sell baked goods to gay people. Number two, thou shalt vote Republican and never, ever get a vaccine. Oh, some of you think I'm meddling right now, don't you? (laughs) Yeah, already. 
Number three, thou shalt punish others into loving Jesus. This is especially true among your own family members. Number four, thou shalt misuse scripture to defend your rights against a godless world and a depraved society. After all, thou art called to be served, not to serve, right? Thou shalt not say bad words because they are obviously a sign that your mind is full of, sh- um, full of excrement. <laughs> excrement. <laughs> excrement. Thou shalt be sure to lecture your pastor about all the things he gets wrong, especially on Sunday mornings. Thou shalt not watch R-rated movies, or or at least have the decency not to talk about them at church. Thou shalt blame women for your lustful thoughts. Thou shalt demand perfection from others and forgiveness for yourself. Thou shalt always be at war with your culture, specifically with the time, place, and society in which God has carefully, lovingly, deliberately placed you. This war is how you will incarnate God's love to your world. Now, we laugh at some of these things because I'm kind of a sarcastic jerk, but um, I got to tell you, when I wrote them, I wept. Uh, And I wonder if when we hear these, if laughing is the appropriate response or if maybe we should all be weeping. But I guess we'll leave that for you. All right, let's continue. Romans 7, 4. You've died to the law so that you may belong. The consequence of dying to the law is that you may belong to another. Uh, Paul is alluding here to the Greek pagan custom of emancipation. This was a process that was frequently used in his time. Uh, And I wrote it down so that I would tell it to you correctly. The ancients had a unique custom to to signify new freedom for former slaves. The slave and his master would travel to a pagan temple where the master would formally sell his slave into the possession of the chosen god. Money would change hands, ending up in the temple treasury, and paperwork would be drawn up announcing this phrase over the slave for freedom. Historians tell us that from that moment on, no one could enslave the emancipated man again because he was the property of the God. The interesting thing about this custom for Christians is that it was this Greek legal phrase for freedom that Paul used to describe to the Galatians our ongoing experience with Christ. Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So we, like the ancient slave who was sold to the pagan god, we have been freed from one thing in order to be freed to another. We've been freed from the strictures, the demands, and the punishment of the law in order that we may be made free to join the family of Christ, join his, his guidance and his world and his eternity. Uh, it's not that now you can just run off and, and live to the extent of your sinful desire. It is that now you belong to someone else, someone who actually cares about you and who, who will bring about hope and healing and health in you. All right. Um, one more thing in Romans 7, 4. Uh, You've died to the law so that you may belong to another in order that we may bear fruit for God. There are three important concepts here. Uh, first... We bear fruit as a community. And I want you to notice the progression that Paul makes here. He goes, you have died, you may belong, and then he makes an abrupt change to we may bear fruit. Um, I don't know exactly how that works. I'm not going to pretend that I do, but somehow some part of being part of the family of God means that Christ creates fruit in us that as a group we share and multiply into our world. Um, It's kind of cool. Haven't figured out how it works. If you figure it out, you know, good for you. Number two, uh, this is important. Fruit is the Holy Spirit's work. It is not the labor that you exert in order to build good character. It is not the the good deeds that you do or the good works that you do or the way that you restrict your life or those things. Fruit is the Spirit of God working in you. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to read to you uh, Philippians 2.13. It says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So let's see. God does the part that makes you will, and God does the part that makes you act. I think that about covers it, right? So stop thinking that what you do 
is what makes you righteous. Or what you do is, is create your own fruit. Uh, what you do is the Holy Spirit working in you to create the fruit. Third important thing about this is that legalism is not fruit. Legalism has zero value whatsoever in the kingdom of eternity. It's a poison that actually kills fruit. Uh, you can look at Colossians 2, 18 through 23 for that, and Matthew 23, 28. And now at this point, we have to ask the question, what is so bad about a little legalism? I mean, let's face it. God is a God of justice and purity and holiness, and couldn't we all do with a little more structure and rules to help us achieve His goals in our lives? Well, if Scripture is true, and I believe it is, the answer to that is no. I mean, just no. Legalism has an enormous number of problems. I'm going to give you just a few. Uh, first, it usurps the rule of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives, uh, Galatians 3.3. 3. That actually is a form of adultery because it takes the created thing, the law, and turns it into uh, something that we worship in place of the Creator who made the law. Legalism also re replaces truth with religion, Galatians 3, 2. It, re it places hurtful, unnecessary burdens on people, Matthew 23, 1 through 4. It is inherently hypocritical, play acting, a lie, Matthew 23, 23 through 27, Luke 12, 1. It must always be coerced and therefore most often leads to violence. Examples of that are Mark 3, 1 through 6, John eleven forty seven 47 through 53, and Acts 5, 17 through 42. Legalism is subjectively judgmental in its application. Uh, just look at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18, 9-14. Legalism out of necessity creates a false caste system of those who claim to be holier than others. Or more humble than others. I once had a guy brag to me about how humble he was. That didn't make any sense, right? <laughs> He's actually the president of a seminary, so shh. Legalism carries a curse. Did you know that? Legalism is cursed. Uh, Galatians 3.10. Jesus hated it. Matthew 23, 23-27. And legalism does not love. 1 Corinthians 3. Thir excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3. And Matthew 23, 36-40. Now, it's possible, even now, you've made excuses for all those things. You say, well, that's someone else. That's not me. That's, that's okay. But... Uh, I think I need to ask you next, then, what did Jesus say about legalism? So we're going to read uh, Matthew 23, 33 through 47. Now, just now, some of you young punks out there opened your Bible and saw a bunch of words on the page instead of a blur of inkiness. You didn't need reading glasses at all. <laughs> I hate you guys. <laughs> it's coming for you. It's coming for you. This is what Jesus said about legalism. He said it to the Pharisees. Uh, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones. Now, uh, I'm going to read this again, and this time I'm going to read it in the VCCP version, the Vintage City Church Paraphrase version. And when I do this, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I want you to listen with your hearts this time not just your ears. Woe to you, Vintage City Church members, hypocrites, for you tithe salary and you give to fit and finish campaigns and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel, woe to you, Vintage City Church members hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Christian. 
First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, Vintage City Church members. Hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. I'm tempted just to leave us right here. Um, I'm tempted for us all just to fall on our faces and repent and, and ask God's forgiveness for the brittle, legalistic way we've expressed him to our world. But as I said earlier, I love you. Uh, I don't want to leave you in this place. So we're going to deal with our fourth question, which is, how then am I to live? I think I've got time to do this. Uh, we're going to go, I'm going to give you four suggestions based on Romans 7, 6. And you can read that behind me, and I, and I want you to notice the key phrase here, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Uh, Morgan, Morgan Appleton, come up and help me with this. And David Trumbo, come up and help me with this. Come up. Morgan, you come up here. Stand over here for me, please. I had thought about, um, you know, teaching and talking through all this, and I thought, you know what I need to do? I need to just show you this. Because the first question we have to ask um, when we're talking about legalism or authentic obedience is what is what? What is legalism? What is authentic obedience? Watch your head there, David. So next time you ask that question of yourself, this is what I want you to picture this moment. What is legalism? What is authentic obedience? You guys ready? I'm ready. You ready? Morgan, my good friend, come give me a hug. Come on. Speed up. Okay, okay, we're doing it like this. Okay, good. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you. David. My good friend, come give me a hug. Yeah, that's what I needed. Thank you, guys. Let's have a hand for my, my assistants. I want you to notice that both of them did exactly the same thing. But it was pretty obvious for you to see which one was legalistic and which one was built out of obedience and love and relationship. Am I right? This is what we need to understand then, my first suggestion, is understand the difference between legalism and authentic obedience. You may do the same thing, but what matters is the relationship that happens while you're doing that. Second, my second piece of advice for you. Um, if we want to live in the new way of the Spirit, we should not legislate. We need to cooperate. Uh, I've taught this for a long time, and I always get people who say to me, yeah, Mike, but the Holy Spirit can't do everything. You've got to do your part. And I'm like... Well, yeah, he can. Uh, and it kind of annoyed me once, I, about six, seven months ago, I went and I, I went through the entire New Testament and I highlighted every single Bible verse that has a direct reference to the Holy Spirit. There are 246 of them, in case you're wondering. And I went through those, those uh, scriptures and in each one I underlined the verb because if I want to know what the subject is doing, I, I'm an English guy, I, I have to find out what the verb is. I, here's what I have to tell you. The Holy Spirit can do it all. I don't have time to go. Th I could spend three months preaching through what I learned in this little study of mine. But the Holy Spirit can do it all. And so when you need help following Christ, when you need help turning from sin, don't turn to rules. Don't turn to porn blockers. Don't turn to uh, social media blockers. Don't turn to any kind of rule, religious expectation. And instead, turn to the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how many times I've been right in the moment of, I'm about to sin, Lord. Here's, it's, it's coming. I just want to do it. And I've said, Holy Spirit, if you don't stop me, it's going to happen. I can't tell you how many times he has intervened to make it not happen. Not because I did anything spectacular, but because he is working in me to will and to act in his good pleasure. A uh, third thing we need to realize, if we want to live according to the Spirit, and I'm going to do this in the next two minutes, I promise maybe two and a half minutes, is uh, we need to understand where sin and temptation comes from. Hey, guess what? Satan doesn't have to bother you at all. Everything that you want to do that's evil is already within you. Listen to what James 1, uh, 14 through 15 says. Uh, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So hey, don't blame someone else for your sin. 
Changing your circumstance probably is not going to change your sin because you're going to do it anyway. James teaches us that sin is a function of desire. And so my fourth piece of advice for you is this. Use desire to overcome desire. Look, um, we are human beings. It is our nature to pursue that which we desire. We will pursue it. That's what we do as infants all the way till the day we die. We are always going to pursue what we desire. So what you have to decide is what do I desire more than sin? Maybe it's integrity. Maybe it's uh, that you desire uh, a better relationship with your father. Maybe it's that you desire um, not to be hurtful. Whatever it is, maybe you just desire not to be overcome by sin. You have to identify that. You have to know what that is so the next time there is persistent sin entering your, your experience, you can turn your thoughts away from that persistent sin, the lesser desire, to the greater desire. And you can say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, right now, turn my heart and mind to the greater desire. All right, take out a pen. We're going to do this to close, and and hopefully we'll be done right in the next 40 seconds. Uh, I want you to think in your mind, first of all, what it is uh, that is that persistent sin that could just continually wreck your life. Now, don't write it, because we don't need to share that in public at this point. But I want you to get it in your mind. And then... I want you to take your pen and I want you to write down three things that you desire more than that persistent sin. And that's what we're going to do for the next minute. So just take your time. Take 60 seconds to begin to think. You may have to finish this when you go home. But for now, start working on that right now. Three things that you desire more than your persistent sin. Let's get to work. Amen. Hey, can you guys say thank you to Mike? He won't like it, but he's he's a member of our teaching team. Most of you probably have at least seen him around, and um, he's a good friend of mine. He's one of the other academic members of the team. We bond over our pathological obsession with books, and he's my neighbor, too, which makes it a little bit easier. But um, if you guys would, please stand. I want to bless you and then send you out on your week. Lord, I pray as this message sits within our hearts that you would just be working in all of us individually, that your grace would be upon us, your face would be shining down on us as we go through our week, that this process, dare we say it, would be easy, that our hearts would be reformed, and we would be more like you come next Sunday. We love you and we honor you. Thank you for this church and all the people in it. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone. It's been great seeing you.